Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention? I think the enthusiasm is already starting in this crowd with all the chatter right now, so thank you for being here. I'm Ann Coralogos. I have the privilege of serving as chairman of the board of Anderson Ranch. Thank you. And it's my pleasure to welcome you for a conversation with Frank Stella. As many of you are aware, this event is being held in conjunction with our recognition dinner, which will take place this evening at the Hotel Jerome. And at the dinner, Frank Stella will receive our National Artist Award, celebrating his contributions as an internationally recognized artist whose career has set an example for oh so many other artists. We are extremely grateful to Mr. Stella for spending time here at the Anderson Ranch campus during his visit and for giving our supporters and others in this community the opportunity to get to know him so much better. I would like to also express our thanks to Janice and Phil Beck who are generously sponsoring this session. Janice, thank you, and Phil. <clears throat> Frank Stella has uh, also been uh, quoted as saying, no art is any good unless you feel how it's put together. At Anderson Ranch, we like to think that we help foster a deeper appreciation of art by giving people the opportunity to learn how it is put together by making art themselves. And if you haven't been here for a workshop, my goodness, we have people who will help you sign up. <laughs> Surprise. We're fortunate today to have a moderator who not only knows Frank Stella and his work, but can help us put his contributions into a broader perspective. Dr. Jeffrey Grove is an internationally recognized curator, scholar, educator, and advisor. His art advisory firm helps institutions and individuals develop exhibitions, collections, and programming strategies. Dr. Grove has organized numerous exhibitions of contemporary art that have premiered and traveled to leading museums such as the Dallas Museum of Art, Museum of Modern Art, the High Museum of Art, Cleveland Museum of Art, and the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. His credentials in the art world are impressive indeed, yet as someone who has spent the bulk of my career in and around policy circles in Washington, D.C., I was particularly intrigued by one of his more unusual curatorial engagements. Dr. Grove was the curator for the International Spy Museum. <laughs> so with great admiration, I will now turn over the program to someone equally adept at shining light on the secret world of espionage and the enigmatic, oh boy, that's bad. <laughs> enigmatic. enigmatic world of contemporary art. I think the spies are after me. <laughs> <laughs> and I've gotten a chance to visit with Jeff a bit over lunch, and he's an absolute delight for those of you who don't know him. And, and the next year, if he does a good job this year as moderating with Frank, yeah. we're going to ask you to come back, happen. and somebody's going to interview you, because you're terrific. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank well, thank you for that very kind introduction, um, and thank you for inviting me to moderate this conversation with Frank Stella, and Frank, thank you for agreeing to do this. And I think it's very fitting that Frank is being honored with this award for a career um, spanning over 55 years, and what I would like to do very briefly is I think that like every artist, Frank would like to talk about new work, but he also is not um, immune to the idea of discussing the trajectory of his career. But I would like to give us a really quick overview of the first half of that career and then circle back to some ideas that inform the, the most recent 20 years of Frank's production. And we're going to leave plenty of time for questions at the end, and uh, we'll be able to enjoy a proper dialogue that way. So what you see right now is some of Frank's most recent work installed in front of the National Gallery in London. But of course, many people know Frank first and foremost for um, coming onto the art scene at the very early age of 23 years old with a radical body of work, the black paintings, then the notched paintings, and paintings in aluminum. And these um, were shown at Leo Castelli's gallery in 1959. As I said, when Frank was only 23 years old, and at the ripe old age of 33, he was the youngest artist ever to receive a retrospective at MoMA. 
And already within that uh, seven year career, I guess it would have been, he had achieved a wide variety of um, ideologies and thematics and the exploration of the materials. And I'm just taking you through some of these. Um, and Frank, if you want to chime in at any point, but I just wanted to give those of you who think you're familiar with Frank's of, and those of you who may not know it, uh, a real quick study of how intensely and radically he was propelling forward the notion of abstract painting and what a painting could be, how pictorial space could function, what a painting looked like, how it behaved. And we found out, I think Frank said that he's the only person in the world who doesn't have one of these paintings because they seem to be <laughs> popping up everywhere. And it, <laughs> it should be noted that, that you have been a, a prolific artist. You, you have an incredible work ethic and you paint um, great series of works. One seems to lead into another and that's why I think it's interesting to walk through uh, a work like Gray Scramble, which leads into a body of work known popularly as the Protractor series. And again, many people are familiar with these. I found it interesting. I heard a younger person today refer to Frank as a minimal artist. And certainly that might be an imprimatur from those who recognize those early, late 50s and early 60s work. But what we'll see through this discovery today is that he's anything but, I don't know if maximalist is the right word, but it is a, a, a development that's a, truly astonishing. And you see that development now in a very chronological way, how forms begin to grow and expand and geometry changes. And then a more radical shift into the idea of what a painting really is and how it behaves. And for many years, there was, I would say, a, a great dialogue around the idea of are these paintings or are they sculpture? Um, it's really a non-argument because they are works of art that sit on the wall. And Frank was a recipient of that retrospective in 1970 at MoMA and then another in 1987. And you've seen work from 1970 to 87 and the true radical movement forward again of someone who's already only in their early 40s and again uh, Frank was the youngest artist the only abstract artist ever invited to deliver the Elliot Norton lectures which he prepared from 1983 I think that you spent two years preparing those yeah at least <laughs> at least and if those of you who haven't read them. They're published as a book called Working Space, but they're also available in the writings of Frank Stella. His writings are truly extraordinary. The insight into pictorial reality, the ideas of abstraction and representation, looking back to the Renaissance and talking about how the trajectory from Pollock backwards and into his own work make a sort of sense. But what I've learned um, from Frank is his great sensitivity for the history of art. And the last time that I was visiting with him, we uh, spoke about early influence, and this painting was one that you mentioned. That I would yeah, love for I you think, to talk about this. Right. Um, it, it came about, uh, it actually was another event, somewhat like this. And in the question and answer period, uh, someone jumped up and said, well, what are your three favorite paintings? And uh, I, you know, it just came out of my mouth. I, 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 I actually don't really know where it came from. But I said Roger van der Weyden's Crucifixion, his deposition, and uh, Zuberan's uh, St. Bonaventure on his beer at the Louvre. And this painting said, uh, but the reason for this painting, they, are, they were my three favorite paintings when I was uh, starting or thinking about uh, making paintings and about whether I really, you know, was going to be or, you know, try to be an artist. And I think that um, this Roger van der Weyden painting was, uh, at the time, it's a little hard to think of it now because it's not such a big deal about abstraction and, say, representational or mimetic painting. But when uh, I was in school, it was still, and uh, in post-war America, it was, still, it was still a kind of challenge, and it was expressed sort of as abstraction versus representation, and then it became a version of abstraction versus European painting, and then an idea of whatever American thought could be considered to be, 
versus humanism, the idea that abstraction was in some way cold and academic and that uh, uh, it was representation alone and particularly European representation that could carry those values forward. So you were doing something, or at least I was interested in something that uh, was not, uh, not clear that this was uh, a way to go or uh, but in fact, it was, I mean, because it was uh, an established fact in, in my time. But this painting uh, struck me just because it was a way of, it represented a goal. In other words, this painting was moving to me, but beautiful. And uh, it, it was arranged and available and so direct in a way that there wasn't any problem with it. It had nothing to do with either representation or abstraction. It was just a way of making art that was absolutely clear and uh, a kind of unequivocal expression of pictorial beauty, one way or the other. And how you feel about the way Christ looks on the cross, the way the others are bereaving, uh, it's all fine. But in the end, the visual impact of this painting is so unequivocal and so straightforward that it seemed to me that it, it couldn't represent anything else, to me anyway, as, uh, but a goal. In other words, if you're going to do this, if you're interested in making art, this is where it can end if you can get there. That's beautifully put. And also, I'm, I mean, just as a formal construction, the way that the painting's put together, is very interesting and I think that in working space you write a lot about pictorial reality and, and construction of Renaissance painting but I also just juxtaposing this with an early painting of yours one that, that um, precedes the black paintings just by a few years I would love to I more than a few years please <laughs> 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 it's in the 50s. <laughs> was this work that you were making when you were in college already? Uh, either in college or in school. But I think I painted this at home uh, in, in the summer, in, but when I was still going to school to, uh, to Andover. And then you went to Princeton yeah. after Andover. Yeah. And oh. then shortly thereafter, you moved to New York. Mm -hmm. And I found a really um, interesting, in your writings um, from the lecture, that you wrote about some experiences of paintings that you encountered in New York, and I'm showing two of those. And you wrote, this is Dubin Yee on the left and a Manet, um, both of these pictures you can see in New York, one at the Frick and one at the Met. And Frank wrote, and forgive me if I go on a little bit with this uh, yeah, quote, what I liked about Dubin Yee was his ability to move paint from place to place. The Manet was a scruffy, exciting, small painting about to burst into an unexpected masterpiece. They made a direct connection for me with the best abstract post-war American painting I admired. Somehow there was a connection between the Pennsylvania landscape of Franz Klein and the Paris hilltops of Edward Manet, as there was between the Charlestown Harbor of my youth and Dalvigny's Dieppe. So you were looking at these. Yeah, that's true, actually. And it's a little bit interesting, because uh, um, as a non sequitur, uh, the Frick <laughs> is trying to expand its uh, right. Uh, expand the museum, and there's a tremendous protest in New York uh, by, about ruining the courtyard and expanding the museum. And the only reason that they could give, they haven't given this as a reason, but I could give it to them. They hardly ever show the Daubigny. So, and I don't know if that's why they're tearing down the courtyard in order to give me a chance to see the Daubigny again. But anyway, and the uh, the, the Manet is sometimes not at the Met either. But anyway, they, they, but they're paintings of a, uh, that are available uh, at a scale. And it's one of the things about New York is that all kind of painting is available. And, uh, and it's, for the most part, I think the Met was even free when I was there. But uh, th these uh, museums, uh, you, you pretty much had them to yourself. And uh, it was the same feeling that you could go to the Frick or you could go see Manet in the Met and you could go to Sidney Janis or Betty Parsons Gallery and see the paintings that Barnett Newman made last week or a painting that de Kooning you know, made a few days ago in East Hampton. And it was this kind of feeling about the city and about what you were doing that it was available to you. I mean, it was a, a, it was a way of... Um, I don't know what you'd call it, a kind of public schooling. But I mean, it was free, and it was there, and it was very useful. And uh, um, 
it's really hard to replicate in any other way because what's different about that kind of experience is that we're looking at reproductions here, but I was looking at the actual paintings there. And uh, the same was true for abstract expressionist painting. Well, and you're talking about the way those artists were handling paint on the canvas too and moving paint back and forth across the surface. And I'm just showing two of your paintings from 1958, circa 1958. One of them interestingly titled Colorado on the left. Uh, yeah, it was. That was supposed to be where Kansas meets the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Mary Lou loves Frank, and I, I just find these following the two landscapes by Daubigny and Manet, the connection sort of undeniable. And I told Frank earlier that I've decided that he really is a landscape artist. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would be happy to still be painting landscapes. There's no, it's not a problem. I think that what really happened is that uh, um, I ended up, I had some idea of the landscape outside of New York City, but actually, uh, I was doomed and uh, had no, the, there wasn't any possibility except the urban landscape, which is a pretty straightforward way of looking at the black paintings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if, if I may just go back, because you brought it up, out of the black paintings, and you refer to them in a way, not as urban landscape, but, but as a reality of the space that you were in. You know, oh, okay. I, wa I, I wouldn't mind going back to Colorado. Yes. Yeah, I'd, lo I'd love <laughs> Since to. Since we're here, I'd I, I would love to hear more about that. There we go. Okay. So these are paintings. I mean, the, what what's most obvious about them is that they're painterly, and the other part of the painterliness is they're not they're not resolved paintings. I mean, they're pretty unresolved. So. I could say that they're student paintings, and you could say, okay, they're student paintings, maybe they're this, maybe they're that, but they're, they're, they're still basically paintings that have ideas that aren't resolved. And you can see in the painting of Colorado, uh, that's tremendously influenced by uh, the painting that was going on on the West Coast, uh, particularly, you know, poor Diebenkorn, he'd probably roll over. But I mean, it, it, but that's quite Diebenkorn-esque. And it wouldn't have happened, uh, uh, I don't think, if it hadn't been for Diebenkorn. Okay, we can get on. But who, who were the artists, I mean, besides Domenio and Manet that you were looking at at that time? I mean, certainly Pollock, you've mentioned several times, is one of the most important yeah, artists. Yeah, Pollock is really important, but you don't, there's a certain point at which you can't look at Pollock, or you don't look at Pollock because it's, it's, it's over in a way, it, it, it's, and it represents something else. And you have, it's something that, you know, it's not clear how you, be, meaning me as an artist, would deal with something like Pollock, because the idea of Pollock is so much greater and so much, well, I suppose in some ways more important, than the, than, than the works themselves. I mean, to analyze the Pollock as a kind of formal painting or uh, related to the, uh, to the other painting around it is kind of pointless because the only thing that counts is what the myth has become and how ingrained it was that this was represented a kind of freedom of expression mm -hmm. that was hard, at first hard to understand and then incredibly incredibly freeing. There's no, there's sort of, uh, it was as though it, it gave artists, uh, uh, or the artists took advantage of this painting, I think, to say, well, we can do anything, anything goes. And this was a perfect example of an anything goes painting because it was just dripping painting, or he was in the magazines, Jack the Dripper, or this or that, <laughs> whatever. Uh, and so that, yeah, and then, uh, unfortunately, his lifestyle didn't help him very much, and it, it ended up, in a way, with uh, unresolved, actually, although the idea is completely ingrained in the uh, art of our time. Uh, the, the last paintings of Pollock, and Pollock's, uh, which, I, which are plenty interesting and may be very good, are completely off limits. So, for example, oh, we don't have it here, but a lot of you might know Frogman, for example, mm -hmm. which sticks in my memory. The, the, the black, uh, plain black stain paintings that he made towards the end of his life. And you say they're off limits because to criticism or to interpretation or? 
You know, it seems beside the point. It's, it's a, in the sense that it's a given. And so I would say that uh, this painting, you know, you're not going to argue with this painting, although Clement Greenberg would say it's not a particularly good one. But I mean, uh, but you know, this is at the Met, and this is a big, this is, and, and I have to agree in a certain sense, there are other Pollocks that you could make a very good case saying that they're better paintings. But then again, what are you talking about? I mean, you know, how much better, or what do you mean by better? And in this case, since it's mainly formal and organizational, uh, you know, it, it becomes a matter of preference, a matter of the way you're seeing it. But then again, if you're not doing it, what does it mean? I mean, how, how, do you, how do you care about the way you land on the runway? You know, whether right. it's two or three bumps or whether, you know, the wind's just right and he puts it down like a feather. <laughs> you know, he got it down, so we get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> But it's interesting what you said, too, and, and sorry to belabor Pollock, but it is important, um, yeah. obviously, because of what Frank's saying. I think that people are somehow not able to look at a Pollock painting without thinking about the act of the making, and that necessarily isn't the case with all abstract painting. And I wonder how you think about that in relationship to your earlier work that's very clearly about pure, ab I don't know, pure abstraction is the right word. Well, this is pure, I mean, I think these paintings like Autumn Rhythm are pure abstraction, and, but, but the thing that's really important about them is how they got to be that way. And uh, Pollock's paintings that preceded these paintings are fantastic paintings. I mean, the paintings that he made uh, during the 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, the Acabonic Crake series, for instance, uh, 46. Yeah, but uh, even before that, uh, She-Wolf mm -hmm. uh, paintings like that. Uh, those are very powerful paintings, and it struck me and when we, land, we were in Denver, so we went to the Still Museum, uh, but there's quite a few things that, the, uh, that are very common to the power and kind of crudeness of Pollock's paintings and of Still's paintings, uh, of their way of making uh, figurative and semi-figurative paintings. I mean, they're kind of brutal, and the way the paint is handled and what goes on, I mean, they're, they are... Uh, you know, it's, it's not what people want to see as beautiful painting. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were hard to take. And a lot of people didn't care much. Uh, somebody was talking, well, they were talking yesterday here, I guess, or wherever it was about, about Peggy Guggenheim. But Peggy Guggenheim uh, was a sponsor of Pollock's and, and helped him out a lot and bought paintings. And, but one time, I mean, she had doubts. And so she was also a friend of Piet Mondrian. And she asked Mondrian uh, what he thought, uh, you know, you know, Pollock did this, what, well, she, should she worry of this like that? And Mondrian just said, you know, forget it. There's nothing to worry about here. <laughs> so the point being that Mondrian, which you could see in terms of Roger van der Weyden, and then its relationship, Roger van der Weyden could see Mondrian, and Mondrian could see Pollock. And it's part of a kind of continuum about what counts as making paintings, in, in the sense that the painting is a, a visual expression. And were you thinking about those issues when you were moving from those early black paintings into the more geometrically composed, removing, because your early black paintings are very, people who haven't seen them in person don't understand how hand-painted they are, and they're not perfectly regimented paintings, whereas mm -hmm. these works become quite, I think that they were probably even metered off and, and constructed mm -hmm. very yeah. carefully. Um, were you actively trying to remove the trace of the artist's hand in this process? Was that important to you? No, I mean, the artist's hand is whatever it is or whatever it takes to get it done. I mean, I think that I, I mean, I like these paintings actually for some, I can't, I'm not always sure why, but I, I know how, I, I know how they happened. Uh, and they were in a certain sense inevitable uh, if I was going to make art because I started out um, under the influence of uh, an idea about what painting should be, of what modernism was when I was only, you know, 14 or 15 years old at school. And the program at school and the way we were taught or it, what was ingrained in us, perhaps indirectly, was uh, two versions of German painting, Albers and Hans Hoffmann. Mm -hmm. 
and it was so straightforward and so direct. But on the other hand, if you have Albers and you, you know, you have to fool around with this, and then on the other hand, if you have to be painterly, you end up being uh, uh, like, uh, like Hoffman. So the idea of you're a minimalist or a maximalist, uh, you know, it, it, there was never any choice. I mean, they were both there, and one way or the other, you were going to have to deal with them. If I happen to do it in a relatively, you know, systematic way, that's my, the way it happened for me. But for most people, that's the way it happens. Uh, how, you, how you began, how you grew up, how you thought about painting is what influences, ultimately, the way you work. And for moving from this into the works that are referred to as Protractor series, which I think, mm -hmm. again, you work uh, in series, and if I understand correctly, there are three typologies in the Protractor series and a certain number of paintings. Within, did you set out to create a series that had a finite beginning and end? You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think that I did. Uh, but I know I had a series of drawings that I made when I was traveling. And uh, when I had... Uh, um, I had this, this idea with the protractor, obviously, is a protractor. So you take one protractor and another one, you put them side by side, you, you cross them over so you get the interlaces. And then I thought about them in terms of the forms and to make, uh, you know, a kind of straightforward kind of Solonet, uh, <laughs> Sonia Delaunay esque. Uh, this is a, a clear reference to early painting in the 20s and 30s. Uh, and then what happened was I had these two ideas and they, said, and they seemed, you know, okay, straightforward or something. And then there was another version that I made that was quite hard. Um, but I don't know if we have a picture. Anyway, the so-called fan shapes, which we don't have. No, and, they, and they were uh, considered wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but you know, now uh, they they actually, to me, seem in a, in some ways slightly better. They they are awkward, but they seem more slightly more abstract, more straightforward. And the others seem, you know, you know, have a harder time defending them, themselves against the pejorative idea of decoration. But you talk about the idea of decoration as not a pejorative in, in, in statements you've made in writings. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about the idea of pattern and decoration. And, you know, there's a whole body of work by primarily women artists. It's referred to as a pattern and decoration movement, often derisively in some ways. But you were quite actively making something that's, you know, subjectively beautiful that deals with ideas of enchantment or engagement through beauty. Correct. Yeah, um, I think the thing that I don't know if it saves them, but the one thing that they had, uh, which is decorative, is decorative. Okay, it's a problem. We, uh, but they, but they said that about Matisse, and of course it was beside the point. And these had uh, a sense of scale, uh, which you know, in a way, helped them uh, because it was kind of they were almost too big to be decorative because nobody really wanted to put them in their house. I mean, <laughs> was, that, was that the idea behind them? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. But at the time I painted them, they were considered a disaster. I mean, <laughs> there, there aren't that many uh, apartments in New York City that like to have 10 feet as the beginning of the painting. <laughs> I'm going, to, I'm going to move a little more quickly through these because um, obviously we could talk for hours but don't have that much time. But, but I would like to stop for a moment when you begin to transition into these more maybe actively Baroque, three-dimensional um, structures that still function. They're hand-painted and they have elements of protractors and other um, tools or measuring mm -hmm. instruments. How did this body of work begin to... Um, metastasize out of that earlier vocabulary of painting for you. Okay, well, we, when I have to go back to that one Polish vi village yes, piece. Yes, oh, yeah, right yeah. here. Okay, yeah, those, those two pictures, yeah. Well, I think this is pretty straightforward. It's not, uh, it's about, um, you work on a surface, all right? And so it, it was a step, I guess, I thought maybe it was a step backward or something, but there was some way that um, it's just hard to, uh, to get away from, at least in the 
20th century, when I was working back there then in the 20th century, <laughs> uh, Cubism dominated uh, 20th century art. And the whole effort after the war, uh, particularly in America, but, but everywhere, the, the goal was to have, you know, to finally, not to have so much modern art as to have post-Cubist art. There was an idea t that ultimately, one way or the other, you had to go if art was uh, were to uh, transform itself in some way, move on. It, it had, it, you know, it couldn't be mired down in Cubism. And uh, that was, you know, hard to take because a lot of things, almost all painting, the, the, the way you put things together and everything, you know, begins to look like Cubism. So most, even very painterly painting is, is quite owing to Cubism. So I was looking not so much at Cubism or another, a kind of variant on Cubism, which would be obviously would be Russian constructivism. Mm -hmm. And so it felt to me that I could work in a, uh, in a fairly straightforward geometric fashion, but I would have to work uh, by varying the surface, uh, what happens on the surface. And the idea behind this was very uh, simple, which was to, instead of working all the time on a, on a given surface and you're making a painting and making imagery on it and doing things, was to build your painting first so, uh, and then deal with the part about painting it. So these were really buildings or built pieces, so, and they were constructions, so it made sense that they were related in some way uh, to constructivism. And you were introducing different materials to construct them as yeah, well. Yeah, this was, uh, the, the, the Polish village pieces were uh, pretty, you know, pretty uh, downplayed. I mean, they're, they're, they're matte surfaces and they're uh, just straightforward materials like felt and canvas and paint. So there was nothing there was no gesture here. The idea was, which is relatively successful or unsuccessful, depending on how you look at it, is that the activity, the way the parts relate together, uh, give you the same sense that you might get from the uh, uh, interlocking brushwork or something like that in a more painterly painting. So this is supposed to be overall painterly. And then <laughs> you took it away. Sorry. In the next one, I did. <laughs> I did make it, it's the same thing, but these are the Brazilian paintings, and you can see they're put together in basically the same way, but it's already more painterly on the surface, so I didn't believe that I was uh, being successful enough in a painterly way by downplaying the surfaces. But you, you use the word gesture, and in a way gestural painting becomes more evident in a piece like the maquette from Montenegro, and the, the next push forward in your work is clearly about gesture and, and a different approach to painting the surface of the object, yes? Well, the truth is there's no real surface here. But then that's another problem. <laughs> but anyway, we don't... But, but because it's not a continuous plane? Right. It, what you work on or, or, or what your notion of a surface is, is that uh, it's a continuous surface. But once you break it up and it becomes a number of parts, you, have a, uh, you really have a different sense of relationship of one image or one, uh, figura one piece of figuration to another one. And in these works, you began to also work with or necessarily larger teams of people who manufacture and construct them. Is that, did your practice change? Uh, yes, I, I mean, I didn't cut out these pieces. They were cut out of, uh, um, out of uh, um, honeycomb aluminum, which had the advantage of being light, but it, it, wasn't, it didn't really like to take a, a paint that well. <laughs> and were you already, uh, did computers exist then, 1979? You, you've been lauded for your early adaptation of using imaging and computers in your work. When did I that, didn't know that anybody you, lauded me for you that. You were lauded for it. <laughs> <laughs> Celebrated even. But um, to tell you the truth, I mean, actually, these are kind of interesting with that remark that yeah. you just made. These are boldly stolen from 17th century uh, drawings uh, for, for stone cutters. And uh, those are, that's straight for, uh, straightforward geometry. Uh, from the 18th century for how to make cones and pillars. And so it, it's as uncomputerized as you can get. It's just appropriated, as they like to say. Right. <laughs> A postmodern term. Mm -hmm. 
So just to move back up to where we were previously, and we had been talking about the idea of landscape, and I wanted to show um, what seems to me to be very recent work, but is not recent at all. This is from 1992. And these and other works that I'll be showing are works that you've cast in the foundry, and mm -hmm. uh, this has been a great occupation of yours since the 90s. And if you could talk about this, this introduction, or maybe not an introduction, but the idea of the base um, and the traditional format of the sculpture embracing a base. Um, and this one, also, you told me that these pieces were actually cast in 1992, but you only recently put the sculpture itself in this present form. Yes, that's true. And they were called scrap before that. <laughs> <laughs> but but they had they were cataloged. <laughs> you, you actually you work as an assemblage artist as a uh, you putting things together and taking them apart. I've noticed that in the studio you have things that were cast decades ago and recently and you're bringing them together in different forms. Is that um, has that been a part of your practice for a long time, or is that something? Yes, I, I, I'm actually in those early pieces that that you showed, uh, uh, like the Indian birds. I mean, there was something about those. Those are kind of put together, and uh, not so differently from the way you might uh, put together parts in the sculpture. But uh, this comes from the practice in the foundry, uh, working with Dick Polich and. Uh, uh, Italics and then uh, Polish foundry. Uh, the fa it's a big foundry, and it's probably the biggest art foundry. Maybe at one time he was trying to make it the biggest art foundry in the world, but it's certainly the biggest art foundry in America. And um, I don't know what to say. It's, it's a very complete foundry. Uh, we can they do uh, we cast in. Uh, um, in aluminum or stainless or, or whatever you want. Most people end up with bronze, but I hardly ever did, ever got that far. Uh, but, and the other thing is that these, a lot of these parts uh, were uh, sand cast. So um, these pieces don't exactly show it, but it, it's a bed of, you all know what sand casting is, it's a bed of sand, and basically you draw in the sand, and the sand has polymer in it, it hardens, and you pour metal in it, and you can just scoop it in, or you can make a top for it and make, uh, you know, make a more elaborate casting. But I just dumped junk in the, in the molten metal. <laughs> And then uh, and drew in the sand, and that produced a way of working which was quite painterly actually, and uh, it was and very satisfying, but not that popular. No, <laughs> <laughs> they will be eventually. Uh, I've I've, no, I've noticed that 30, 40 years does a body of work good, um, and just to underscore the fact that the idea of making sculptural objects and painting continue to be moving forward side by side. But I wanted to jump to um, some of these larger works. And here mm -hmm. you actually see this installed where your studio is now, mm -hmm. um, Fishkill from 1995. Yeah. One of the things is, I mean, you can see that that's a combination. Those are very crude castings, uh, but that's what made me popular at the foundry. They didn't have to do anything. And no matter how bad it was, <laughs> no matter how bad it was, Frank would like it. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, the castings, and then there are, of course, and the other stuff is scrap, uh, real scrap, uh, found materials, and you combine them. And I think that you can see in this, and uh, it was uh, there all along. I mean, I always was uh, uh, very happily influenced or involved with John Chamberlain, and, and uh, he, has a, he had a way of making sculpture which was really very painterly. So in a way, although this isn't particularly colored, the gesture and the way this only happens by somebody who, this is not particularly sculptural. I mean, most sculptors don't put things together this way. So it's, uh, you could use a horrible phrase, say, pictorially informed. But anyway, this is sculpture made by a painter, uh, for better or for worse. And, uh, and I don't think it would have happened if it hadn't been for the example of John, uh, whose work I used and who, uh, was very good at sort of talking about things or, uh, you know, he had a way of working that was uh, just uh, easy 
to follow, I could say imitate or something, but he had a casualness that was, uh, but, but very directed kind of casualness and a very straightforward way of working with the materials. And uh, these are complicated uh, in some sense. A lot of it's casting and a lot of it is scrap. But the attraction of scrap is that it, um, and you can see it a lot in John's work, is that um, scrap is, is material that's been manipulated. And most of the manipulation has been by the crusher. And the crusher does things uh, to the material. Like um, uh, you could take a Don Judd box and give it to Chamberlain, and he could crush it. And it would still be interesting, although it would no longer be a minimalist work of art. But the crushing and the, that, that kind of application of forces to the material is what makes things happen and that uh, you can relate to. And uh, it gives you a way of moving on. And then, again, you know, uh, finding other pieces like that or maybe unlike that and seeing how they relate. So you have a way of going ahead. So if these are sculptures made by a painter, are these paintings made by a sculptor? Are they paintings made by a sculptor? Mm -hmm. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to talk about this work for a moment for two reasons. It's, it's um, casting, but it's also, um, I believe, and, and this actually is the work that uh, brought me to meet Frank in the first place on September 11th, 2001. We were in his studio together. And um, this actually, elements of this were generated, they were smoke images that uh, were? Yes, we blew. Uh we blew uh, smoke rings into a black box with six sides and uh, photographed it. And then I uh, used the photographs uh, uh, on the, on the uh, modeled them on the uh, computer, scanned them, and then modeled them on a computer. And then made a, a kind of crude version of it that we could then uh, use the scanning to uh, build, uh, to cast. Now, I'm Actually, this was done with them. Um, the, small, the model for that was actually done with uh, 3D printing, as they call it now. <laughs> See, so you were in the vanguard, but have to admit it. So I'm moving through rather quickly now, uh, work bringing us up to the present date, and I think that you see the typology of forms and the interest in um, collaging elements you know, found and produced in the, in the foundry and the studio coming together, but I wanted to stop for a moment around the idea of architecture, which you've explored um, greatly. And I hope that in 2007, people saw the exhibition at the Met and also the works on the roof. And this has been an ongoing concern of yours for many years. Um, and I'm showing, pardon me, just move forward, some of the ideas for address and city plan that you were invited to submit. And then um, the Constantine Museum proposal. And of course, all of these are unrealized, but is this, can you talk a little bit about your interest in architecture as habitat rather than as? Well, I mean, I get, you know, basically it's a, a way of thinking about architecture, which really is coming, uh, is really about form and, uh, and how the forms can grow basically. And uh, the hope is that uh, the form can both grow and express itself in such a way that it becomes habitable. And so that's the idea, not to be, uh, but the problem is it, it, it hardly ever uh, can conform to the client's idea of what he wants. But you're still, you're still open to proposals, right? No, no. not anymore. <laughs> But you have collaborated with architects. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, it's easy with Calatrava. And I just wanted to show images from most recent body of work that was actually at Miriam Boski's gallery uh, this last year, within the year. And these works, and I'm showing you the front and the back of K150, and this is a side view. They seem so playful and light at this time. And I'm sure that they're not actually in the production of them, but. Um, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, at a, at a certain point, uh, you make advances or you, you can do things uh, more easily that you thought you couldn't do, but then everything comes with a new problem. And these are, you know, it's 
it's hard to put them together. There's a limit to the uh, bed of the machinery that can produce these kind of pieces. And then uh, and in the end, the uh, material is fragile. So you have the geometry where you can come to a needle point. I mean, you can almost prick your finger on the end of some of those points. On the other hand, if you prick it sideways, you can break it. I mean, so, you know, you, you don't advance. But the materials do change, and um, they make materials now that are more flexible. It's a polymer? Uh, yes, yeah. yeah. And so you, you, you move on. But you can do things here that it, I don't know how much it's worth or anything, but it is to have, to have the individual elements scanned. Uh, then you, once they're scanned, uh, the, the computer is relatively helpful in, in putting them together because you can pass through them. And you, whatever you do, the geometry, as complicated as it may be, it's easily replicated, the, the geometry, and you can pass it on to the machine. So the, uh, it, it's able to build it in layers. And uh, it's called printing a lot of times, but most of these things, these big things, are, are sintering, which is, just means that it's either a liquid or a, or a powder, and, uh, uh, and it's catalyzed by a, a laser that draws the line that could be printed one time at a time, one bit at a time. OK, I'm just going to show two more slides and then open this to questions, because time has flown. But, um, I love to hear Frank talk about other artists, and I'm showing um, two artists that Frank admires, Ellsworth Kelly, of whom you said, Ellsworth Kelly is America's, and by extension, the world's greatest living abstract painter. And you have that from someone who should know. <laughs> <laughs> and you spoke earlier about Hans Hoffman, and you wrote of him, in our century, Hans Hoffman has produced more successful colored explosions on canvas than any other artist. So these are artists that inspire your own work? Yeah, and I, it's true. <laughs> I mean, it's, as, or as they say, manifestly evident. So it's not, and, not much to say. And I should mention in closing, for those of you that don't know, that Frank will be the subject of yet another career retrospective that opens at the Whitney um, this autumn before traveling to Fort Worth Modern Museum of Art and is it the de Young? The de Young in San Francisco. But my final question to Frank is, is it true that imitation is a serious form of flattery? <laughs> Because like it or not, you've been very influential on <laughs> other artists. And I'm showing you a work from French artist Boutron Lavier and then uh, Richard Pettibone from the 70s. And uh, I think that people are now buying Pettibones because they can't get a Stella. <laughs> and the auction prices for those talking about the talk yesterday, which was all about the market, is what the price of a Stella would have been seven, in the 70s. Yeah. But how do you feel about these? Types of I, I, you know, I think it's, I, I don't think it's particularly flattering for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, one way or the other, it's inevitable, so it, it's not worth worrying about it. Okay. That's probably the right attitude. Well, thank you, Frank. And We have a few minutes for questions. There are microphones. If you raise your hand, um, we'll call on you, and they'll bring a microphone to you. So does anyone have a question for Frank? No, good, great audience. <laughs> yes? In your, in your talk, you mentioned the word painterly quite a few times. And I was just wondering if you could give a personal subjective description of what you believe the term painterly means. Well, I'm not sure what it means, but I mean, I can, it, but by painterly, generally speaking, it, it means that there's a, a quality and a gesture. It's actually more than anything else texture. I mean, painterly painting is often uh, seen as the opposite of painting, which aims to suppress, suppress the ability to see the brush stroke. So Dali is uh, not a painterly painting, painter. And uh, Hans Hoffman would be a particularly painterly painting. But it's, about, it's really from a, a, an old academic tradition, really about the, actually the suppression of brushwork is uh, the most common way to be not painterly. It's tricky, with, I mean, because uh, what would you say about Roger van der Weyden? Right. Who else has a question? Yes, Mira. 
Hi, um, Frank. Uh, you were, you witnessed the conversation yesterday. Could oh, you? Yeah. Could you? No, I don't remember anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> could, That's could, been suppressed. Uh, we. Uh, could you just give us your take? I mean, just any take you want to take on that conversation would really be appreciated by me. Okay, I can do it in one sentence. Buyer beware. <laughs> the, conver the conversation was about the art market and the, the next coming crash. So there, it, was, it, it was a bracing conversation and a little bit depressing for some of us. <laughs> Don? <laughs> uh, I have a vague memory, and if I'm wrong, ignore the question. But were you and Carl Andre together at Andover? And yes. If, and if so, did you have a, any interesting dialogues between two uses? You, you don't have it? a dialogue with Carl. <laughs> <laughs> it's not possible. So what did you have? <laughs> did you, was there well, any communication? No, I mean, um, you know, he, he just goes on and on. <laughs> and, you know, you listen for a little bit and then you go on to do whatever you're doing. <laughs> Try to be polite. Okay, we have time for one more question. Yes. Can you bring the microphone right back here? Hi, thank you for being here. And um, in the work that we in some of the work that we just saw or the pieces where it appeared that your work had been appropriated, uh, that is a way of looking at it, and you've been so involved in the battle for artists' rights, I'm interested in how you feel about appropriation in general as a form of art, which seems to be coming more and more um, accepted in the contemporary art world. Well, it, actually, it's an interesting way, the way you're framing it. it. It's as though you're talking about artists using ideas about other artists. But what the real problem seems to be is it does get commercialized. And so uh, the artists need to have, maybe they don't need so much protection against, or, uh, against other artists, but they do need protection from the real world. I mean, uh, you know, copyright is copyright. And uh, the artists don't have much going for them other than the images that they make and that they, sh they should be entitled to their copyright images, to the copywriting of their images. Amen. All right. On that note, thank, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Anderson Ranch. Thank you, Frank. Thank you.